Eject. We have a choice to follow. Hallelujah. Matthew 22, please. Matthew 22. Training for reigning. Welcome to Sunday morning live. Where religious is not alive. <laughs> Religion dies and Christ lives. Matthew 22. Is everybody there? We're going to start at verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Of course, we know that's the father making the arrangements for his son. Amen? And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Think about how long it took you to accept the invitation. Again, he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made what? Light of it. You know, people are still making light of salvation. They're still making light of death and hell. It's so unfortunate there's not one unbeliever in hell now. They all believe, but it's too late. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. And the rest sees his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. Sounds like the Democratic Party. But when the king heard... About it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, wedding ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. In other words, he did not have the garment of righteousness. He did not have a DNA that brought, allowed him eternal life. And he said to him, friend, isn't that exactly what he said to Judas? Friend. How did you come in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot. Take him away and cast him into outer darkness. That's called hell. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many have been invited, but few have accepted. That's what this means. Many are called, but few are chosen. Again, they made light of salvation. Many people are still making light of salvation. Even if they've gained salvation. Even if, Remember, it's a gift. Anybody ever give away your gift? They made light of salvation. They're too busy. They get involved in hatred and violence and murder. They weren't worthy. Why? Because they were covered with sin. They were unworthy because they still practiced sin. They were still being influenced by Satan's network system. Then he said, okay, I'm going to invite all those who are good and bad, willing to change or exchange their good and bad for righteousness and justice. 
Garments are associated with fruits also or conduct of a character. There's a wedding coming soon, and that's when Christ will come and take his bride away. The wedding garments are righteous judgment. They are righteous and justice. They are also associated with priestly garments. And a priest is one who ministers to the Lord. Again, many invited, but few accepted the invitation or, and the calling of an eternal purpose. They were not willing to disconnect from the worldly lusts and sinful living to be connected to the eternal home in heaven. And God let them go their way. He still lets them go their way. He doesn't force anyone. He draws them, but he doesn't force them. Amen? In John 14, this wedding will take place in heaven. It's not on earth. But symbolically, there's marriages that are done on earth, to, which is a parallel of things that are associated with what Christ is going to do. Christ is the bridegroom and the body is the bride. In John 14, hallelujah, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come and get you. <laughs> I'm going to receive you to myself. And where I am, there you'll also be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to the Lord, he said, we do not know where you're going and how we can know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for through me. If you had known me, you would all have also known my Father. And from now on you know him because you see me, you see the Father. Jesus is the Father in this realm. He manifested himself. To gather as many souls to the Father, to come into the wedding. Jesus had to pay the price to open the gateway to heaven. By his death and resurrection, we call this an eternal port, or it's called the gateway to heaven. In this gateway to heaven, many have traveled through it. In fact, there have been many who have died and traveled through it and then come back and have testified about this gateway. It's pretty amazing in how the tabernacle of God is known as the gateway. Ezekiel saw the gateway be established in heaven. God directed Moses to build the gateway or the eternal port on earth. So it would be an example. That's why there's the way, truth, and life, which parallels with the way to get in. Deny yourself, fight, and follow. Does everybody get it? Deny yourself, pick up the cross, which means fight and follow. Those are the three, three chambers of the tabernacle. And those are the three, that is the formula that God has given me and you so we can parallel and access and maintain the entrance of the gateway to heaven, which is home. In 1 John chapter 2. Gateway to heaven. As new creations in Christ Jesus, we, you and I have gotten a new DNA. God recognizes that DNA. DNAs can change. People don't realize that. By things that we partake of can change our DNA. In verse 3, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. 
Now by this we know that we have known him. Is everybody there? If what? If we keep his commandments. We know him if we obey him. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, which is he's talking about his commandments, anything that God commands is, is law and it's his word. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who abides in him ought not, ought to himself also walk just as Jesus walked. Does everybody get it? Walk just as Jesus walked. In other words, in character, in morality, in integrity. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is what? In darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has what? Blinded his eyes. These are people who hate people. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you from his, for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he... Who does the will of God shall what? He shall abide forever. He who keeps his words and abides in Christ ought to walk just like Christ walked in, again, in conduct, in integrity, in righteousness. In other words, we, God wants us into a place where we approve what he approves of and we disapprove what he disapproves of. But he talked about the violence and hatred, sexual abusers, rebellious, those who walk in darkness, they are blinded to the way of truth and life. They are blinded to the gateway to heaven. Purposely blinded. God will not allow them in. They have been taken captive by Satan's influential network called sin. They are lovers of the world. They are lovers of Sin and lust. They have been taken captive. We're going to talk more about some of this Tuesday, especially about mind control. But right now we're going on another course. Matthew 7. God willing. You never know what daddy may do. Gateway to heaven. Matthew 7, 13. Enter by the what? Narrow, Narrow gate. What gate might that be? It's called the gateway to heaven. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction or what we call hell. And there are many who go, ooh, go in by it. Many. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Difficult is the way. Why? Because the enemy will resist you as much as he can. Try to confuse you, deceive you. Even after you accepted Christ, He'll do everything he can to prevent you 
from getting home. He doesn't care what you do here. He doesn't care if you read the Bible. He doesn't care if you come to church. He doesn't care anything. He wants to try and convince you to stay in sin, which will prevent you from getting home. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. In verse 15, he said, beware of what? False prophets who come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. In other words, they look like they have a righteous garment on, but inwardly they are what? Ravenous wolves. They're rebellious. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every bad tree bears, every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bear, bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Now, you got to understand, a good tree can bear bad fruit only if it's been contaminated by darkness. In other words, it was good, now it's bad. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will what? You will know them. Now he comes to the conclusion, and he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven or shall go through the gateway to heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So somehow these individuals knew the Lord at some time, or they wouldn't have called him Lord. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Wow. Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. See, they thought they would gain the access to the gateway of heaven by works and not by relationship. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will like him in to be a wise man who built his house on the rock, which is the anointing. And the rain came, descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be a foolish man who built his house on sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Great was its fall. In other words, we enter, that gate is narrow. But he's given us the information. He says, look, you got to hear my word, and you got to obey my word. You got to have fellowship with me. You need to be connected with me. Or there'll be a false gateway that will open, but it isn't mine. Again, he expressed the importance. Jesus was talking about people that were believers and went the wrong way. They went the wrong way. And there are many out there right now proclaiming to be believers, living a life of sin, living a life of hatred. Living a life of fornication and lust. Living a deceptive life. Living a life of self. Instead of walking in the formula that gains us access to the gateway to heaven, which is deny yourself, pick up the cross, fight, and follow. Matthew 25. Gateway to heaven. And there's something that we've got to come to the arena of because of maintaining clean garments, maintaining the DNA and righteous garments. We've got to come to a place where we are constantly approving what God approves of and disapproving what God disapproves of. We cannot compromise that. Why? Because you'll get contaminated. It will spot your garment. We are to be exposers of evil and promoters of righteousness. Because see, if we're not exposers of evil, then we're promoters of evil. Does everybody get it? Matthew 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened ten virgins, which means they were clean by, cleansed by the blood of Christ, 
who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Here it is talking about the wedding again. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, but while the bride, um, and there were five foolish who took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the five wise ones took oil with them in their vessels with their lamps. Why? Because five of them were staying connected. The other five were not. They were depending more on their works than they were on being connected in relationship. It says, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. No one can share their oil. I cannot give my oil to anyone else. Just doesn't work. Everybody must pay the price for their own oil. That's why there's a lot of good people out there. They go to church. They pay tithes. They try to do everything they can to do the right thing, but they're still living a life of sin or lawlessness. And they will, that door will be shut to them because they do not have that seriousness of conviction by the Holy Spirit. They have compromised in every area in their life. They're still trying to fulfill the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. They're not willing to disconnect from world. God is not number one, even though they proclaim it and say it. But their life of fruits shows that God is not one, number one. Everything else is before their God. Families, children, businesses, money, everything is before their God. Oh, yeah. And Jesus says something powerful. So at midnight the cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming out to go meet them. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Reality was they're realizing that their lamps are going out. And it's come, becoming too late. They're hoping that there can be a rescue now, but there can't be. It's too late. But the wise answered and said, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourself. Buy for yourself. And while they went to go buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. In other words, there is a place, a position where you and I must be ready all the time. All the time. We must be on an area to where if Jesus showed up this second, at any second of my life, am I going home? Not maybe later. Not maybe if I do this. Not maybe if I do that. But now. Because he's the God of now. Will I go home? Hallelujah. Verse 11. I'm going to do 10 again. And, and, and while they went to go by, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was what? Shut. Once it's shut, that's it. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to him, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Coming. The bridegroom delayed. That's happening right now. There's a, a delay. Amen. There's a delay happening. We must keep our garments clean from sin, from lawlessness. We must not allow the enemy to cause us to be disconnected from God's presence and from his will and from being our first love, no matter what. We can't do that. In Revelation chapter 3,
in verse 1, Revelation 3. And the angel of the church in Sardius write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works that you have a name that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardius, who have not defiled their what? Garments. And they will walk with me in white. For they are what? Worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. Overcomes what? Sin. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, do not defile your garments. Why? Because he's talking about walking with Jesus when we get home in white. In verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Lord the Seans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, which is oil, that you may be rich in white garments, and that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and the anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see what I see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. I'm going to say that again when you get corrected, when you get rebuked. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be what? Zealous and repent. Because I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and him with me. And to whom who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Overcome. Overcome. Everything is about overcome. And you and I can't overcome without the anointing. Amen. We can't overcome. What is the price? Cooperation. Cooperation with the Spirit of God. Now, those who are led by the Spirit are called sons of God. Sons of God and daughters of God get home. Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Gateway to heaven. Hallelujah. You know, I, I preach what I'm told to preach. Most of us have an understanding in this, but I believe it's got to be a reminder. Why? Because something is coming, and I shared already, I think it was Friday night, about a false storm. And the enemy is going to come and with a false storm. And many believers are going to take hold of it. Many believers will be misled. There are things that are getting ready to be released. And God's going to expose his righteous. And how is he going to expose his righteousness? Through his children of righteousness. And Matthew 27, 35.
You know, it's amazing to me that there are still so-called believers that are still approving of abortion. I, I, it still baffles me. Man, they want to argue with you over it. And they want to post it all on whatever, flesh book. That they're promoters of a democratic and libertarian party that promotes things that God disapproves of. It blows me away. And then they call themselves Christians. Well, let me tell you, the gate is shut to them, and they don't even know it. When it comes time for them to enter that gate, it will be shut, and their minds are going to be blown away. Why? God, I did this for you. I did this for you. The same thing that we just read. Lord, Lord. I witnessed for you. I brought many to your kingdom. Yes, and you misled many to my kingdom too. Phenomenal to me. Phenomenal. In verse 35, it says that they crucified, then they crucified Jesus and did what? They divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and then when they went to put up over his head the accusation written against him, it said on there, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Okay, God allowed his garments to become divided. That was the price that he would pay in exchange for our new garments. Everything associated with the cross was an exchange, even the garments of righteousness. He could not get into hell wearing those garments. They had to be stripped from him so that he could put garments of sin on. Does everybody get it? He couldn't get into hell in a righteousness. He had to get hell into hell by taking on our sins, which qualified him to get to hell. Amen? And then there was an exchange. He removed our defiled garments for undefiled. He paid the price for me and you. And Matthew 9. Matthew 9. Gateway to heaven. If there's a gateway to heaven, there's a gateway to hell. Matthew 9 and verse 18. While Jesus spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died. But come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his righteous garments. For she said to herself, if only I could touch his garment, I will be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, for your faith has made you well. And a woman was made well from that hour, touching the garments of righteousness. And Matthew 14. In verse 34, that garment is also a representation of the anointing. The anointing heals. The anointing breaks every yoke. The anointing frees. Matthew 14, 34, when they had crossed over, they came to a land 
of Gesseret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent out into all the surrounding region and brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his what? Garments. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. All were made perfectly well by touching his undefiled garments. This is telling me and you that we must maintain a connection to everything that touches him. Somebody get it? You and I must maintain a connection to everything that touches him. That's why the word says only hang out with those who have a pure heart. Stay away from those who call themselves brethren that are not right. Be careful of those who you associate with. Be careful of everything. That's why the word says come out from a moment and don't touch what is unclean. He's talking about things that are spiritually unclean that contaminate your garments. And Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrew. Hebrews chapter 10. I believe that this is a revelation to those that don't know that are coming to Christ and those that proclaim to be Christians. It's a warning. 1024. And let us consider one another in order to what? Stir up love and good works. How do you do that? Assemble. Not forsaking to assembling ourselves together as man is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin or a covering or an open door to heaven. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, and I'll repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. That's defiled garments by sin. There's no entrance to the kingdom. In Galatians chapter 5. And again, one of the problems was is because of the lack of abiding, assembling, connecting, maintaining connection. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Oh, is everybody okay? Let's speak it together, please. I say then walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so you do not do the things that you wish or desire that are offensive to God. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, or the works of sin, are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which means also drugs, Hatred, contentions, 
jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, those who practice, it's got nothing to do with it says whether you're a Christian or not. And in fact, this letter, this epistle was written to the Church of Galatian. These were believers. He was warning them. He said, you practice this way, you live this way, this is called sin. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because the door will be shut to them. First Corinthians 6. Why? Because sin defile, def defiles our garments. Oh, hallelujah. First Corinthians 6. You know, people want to argue whether you're once saved, always saved. If somebody wants to argue me with about it, that person ain't saved as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you want to argue me, well, you don't know your history. Now make history and get saved and get filled with the Holy Spirit and do the things that are right. It's a religious moron spirits <laughs> full of pride and fear. They're afraid they're going to get caught or exposed. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be what? Deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, that means lesbians and transgenders, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor extortioners, nor covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revelries, will inherit the what? Kingdom of God. That doesn't mean that we're to hate these people, we're to love them. Amen? We want to lead them to the Lord. How are you going to lead them to the Lord? You're going to lead them to the Lord by Christ's conduct, by the anointing of God. You're not going to grab somebody, oh, you're going to hell. No. I mean, you'd like to, but I'm not, don't. You're going to show the love of Christ, which is going to lead them to want to know who you know. And then you're able to lead them to Christ. And explain to them that that way of life, there is no gateway to heaven. We've all practiced, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't, there's no difference in sin. Sin is sin, whether you're a murderer or whether you're a fornicator or whatever, whether you're a liar, it doesn't matter. Sin is sin. Sin contaminates the garments and you cannot access the gateway home. 1 John chapter 5. So the works of sin, no entrance. There'll be a sign out there, no trespassing. Chapter 5. Again, we want to associate, we want to maintain a connection to anything that touches him. Does everybody get that? Does the word touch God? Yeah. Does worship touch God? Yeah. Does other believers touch God that are right with God? Amen. So we associate with everything, movies, music, everything that touches him we want to associate with verse 18 first john chapter 5 verse 18 we know that whoever is born of god does not sin or associate with sin but he who has been born of god keeps himself from sin and the wicked one does what doesn't touch him 
We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one that promotes sin. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Then he warns us, little children, keep yourselves from idols, which is sin. Keep some, so we are individuals who keep ourselves from acting on the influence of Satan's networking system. We depart from evil. We keep ourselves away from idols. We keep ourselves uh, connected to fellowship and abiding in his word and his presence. We stay filled with the Holy Spirit and relationship. We keep connected no matter what. And we keep connected with the things that touch God. I'm going to close at 2 Peter 1. Second Peter chapter 1. You know, it's not always how you start. It's how you end. Amen? Amen? So we might have had a rough start, but praise God, we can always get in line. And remember, God doesn't look at anything that's under the blood. Once you've repented from it, it's gone. He's not looking at who you were, he's looking at who you are in Christ. He's looking at who you are becoming. Remember, David wrote and said, man, I can't, I, 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 I can't wait till I waken in your image. No. You got to remember something now. The powers of darkness do not look at you the way you look at you yourself in the mirror. This is one of the problems I think many people have. They're still looking at themselves the way they look. The demons don't see you. They only see you if Jesus ain't there. But when they come up to you, they see Jesus. They don't see you. Only if Jesus is not first. That's why David said, I always set the Lord before me. Why, if you set the Lord before you in everything in your life, you got nothing to worry about. And when you set the Lord before you, the demons see Jesus. They don't see you. But when you don't set the Lord before you, then they see you. Then you get attacked. But you got to remember that the powers of darkness are still trying to attack you and convince you so that you go before Jesus. Then you become the idol. But anything that's before you and Jesus, or in between you and Jesus, is called an idol. And the, enemies know that. the enemy knows that. He knows how to play us quite well. But Christ, who is in you, is greater than he is in the world. And the Holy Spirit will lead you to all truth if you're connected with him. If you're in fellowship with him. If you're hearing. If you're sensitive. If you're looking, if you, if you don't mind to be convicted, if, you, if you're looking for conviction, Lord, correct me if I'm wrong. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the what? Knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him, who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceedingly and great precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For these things are yours and abound. <laughs> you will never be what? Barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call or your invitation sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly. So now I want you to think about this. You will never stumble. 
Then it talks about an entrance being provided. Why? Because can that stumble cause you from entering the kingdom? Yes. Yeah. Sure can. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be neglected nor negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. So we need to be reminded. Amen? We need to be stirred up and encouraged. We want to fulfill what God has asked us to do and not what our flesh wants us to do. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word and we ask again for your forgiveness, mercies, and grace. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to keep us connected to your presence, your power, and your truth, and the anointing. Keep us in an area where we maintain a pure heart and clean hands, sensitive enough to depart from evil, seeing those things that the enemy has set traps for, and granting us eyes to see things all the way through. Lord, we just take this opportunity, we forgive and bless all those who have persecuted us or used us or spoke against us or even offended us and rejected us or maybe didn't live up to our expectations and anything that we've held anyone for anything we let them go we forgive them and bless them and commit them into your hands and hope that they will find a gateway to heaven as we commit them into your hands lord lord prepare our hearts for communion and let communion be a reminder of the price that you've paid for us and the exchange you made on the cross that we could have the opportunity to come home in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.